Diego, once again, thank you for thank you very much for your presence here uh, and for being with us in the circle. So the stage is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you, Pedro. Thank you, Nelson. Thank you, everybody. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here with you. Uh, I know it's a, a tough time or a tough, tough hour to be connected just Friday uh, mid midday. For me, it's just early in the morning, so that's not that bad. So thank you so much for being here. Uh, what I want to do is, is a little, uh, I would say, I will take a, a different path, not just jumping into the theme, so you will see it on the PowerPoint. I'm presenting a little bit uh, part of the research group to try to frame a little bit what I'm doing right now. Uh, and it's a little bit different in terms of, uh, I would say like a classic communication or presentation of 25, 30 minutes. And that's about the time I'm gonna be talking and then I will just open the microphone. So, but if you see something that you need to just jump in, please feel free if you wanna do it in English, in Spanish, in Portuguese, I, I do understand, but sometimes it's a little bit hard for me, but we, we can solve that. That's not a problem. Uh, and why I'm doing this is because I think I'm the, the newest guy in town in the circle. So that means that maybe you've heard a little bit about Tec de Monterrey or Mexico or whatever. So I want to just put that part in so we can, if you want to start the dialogue from there and see other researchers or who are part of the group and how it's constituted or whatever, I think it's a good idea. So uh, I will start sharing the presentation. Uh, I do have access. So if you don't see it or if you don't hear, please just tell me and I'll make whatever I have to do to make the, the connection work. Oh, that's uh, fine. That's fine. Perfect. So I, I used, I, I did like a, a direct citation of John Berger's book, Ways of Seeing. Uh, and this is a little bit, I never liked my titles, but I had to live with this one. So I, when I said it, I thought maybe, maybe it's not the best idea. I'm not actually working with Berger's. Well, I use Berger as a, as a framework, but it's not actually in the presentation. So that could be like a question or a way of of working around. But what I was thinking is that we have like this visual dominance uh, going on in, in the theoretical approaches that we at the group are working. And we're starting to step down a little bit from using so much image oriented theory and start to working out other ways of uh, approach to multimodal analysis. So that means that we start to think about sound with image or sound being predominant in a case rather than just you using theory that it's related to image. Uh, and my formation, it's basically, I've been working for 20 years with uh, documentary theory and documentary production. That's like my main line. And I just jumped like a few years ago, I would say like six years ago to start working with interactive documentary or iDocs or web, dog webs, how you want to call it. Um, and I've been struggle, struggling a little bit uh, to make a match between, I would say, the classic canonical approach to documentary theory, especially the American, uh, specifically Bill Nichols, that it's like the main theory that I studied and I'm working around. Actually, I'm writing a paper on, on I would say like an uh, like an update of, of Bill Nichols' approaches to cybernetics. So I'm trying to see how digital media and uh, classic theory and documentary are matching or mismatching in this moment. So this was like the base for working the the, the actual presentation. Uh, so this is our group. It's a it's a small group. Uh, it's not. It's not the only one. We are like three groups inside of the humanities and education school. Uh, this is the smallest one. We are just seven researchers and it's a very young uh, group. We've been together for two years only, uh, even though we've been doing research uh, for more years than that. 
uh, actually, the, the the formation of the schools in Tech de Monterrey, it's, it's a recent thing. We have like five years. We were more like a teaching oriented school. And now we are trying to do a lot of more research. And they're starting to make some labs and some bigger groups and some projects to start to make the concentration of the researchers. But we are just we've been working for two years. We have a seminar like this and we've been doing it just for a year and a half so that's about how much time we've been trying to do projects together uh but we have from philosophers cultural studies people uh transmedia people uh and we come from different backgrounds uh some of them studied in in mexico but i would say that at least four of us have studied outside and three of us studied at spain so that tells you a lot of the traditions and the perspectives that we work with. Um, two of us studied at, at Pompeo Fabra. I did the more classic uh, program. Uh, Carlos Scolari was, wasn't there yet. And Noemi was actually working with Scolari in the Horizon 2020 project. So we have a, a line that works with transmedia and transmedia literacies. And the other guy that studied outside of Mexico, he's a cultural studies from Canada. So we have a little bit of everything. Uh, and to put you a little bit into, for, into a, I would say a more precise framework, this is one of the projects we've been working on, collaborating with uh, UC Davis, uh, with Robert Irwin McKee. And this would be like a good example of, of what we are doing and what we're intending to do. This is like the kind of projects that we like and that are aligned to what we are trying to build together and some of the lines that Tecne Monterrey is trying to pose to make uh, research. And this would be like the three main elements that we highlighted as uh, relevant for our research, that it's using the, the, the United Nations uh, sustainable uh, goals uh for the 21st century so it's a social impact oriented research it's not just a theoretical uh kind of research or just writing papers we do need to make some social intervention or social impact uh, mainly the school it's working around digital turn or digital humanities uh we opened an ma program in digital humanities like three years ago and we are preparing a second master's program related to that uh and finally we're shifting a little bit from contents to focusing methodologies so we're working a lot through multimodal analysis and going through transmedia and interactive uh i would say technology-based prototypes uh we don't have the the experience or, and you will see it through my presentation, or the resources to actually do some, I would say more lab oriented or prototyping things. So we're just using like uh, free technologies, we're doing just blogging or this collaborative approach to uh, media production. So we're doing a lot of participatory documentary production. And this is connected also to the uh, undergrad program in communication. So we've been doing some experiences of uh, working with communities around Mexico and in the border. And we had this project with, uh, with UC Davis that it's related to deportation through the Mexican American border. And there are around 350 stories in the blog. So you can go through it. Uh, Robert Irwin has been working with participatory uh, documentary since I think it's like 15 years or so, and we collaborate a lot with them. That's one of our, I would say, main uh, relationships right now. Uh, we are also relate, related to the Catedral Latinoamericana de Transmedia in Rosario, Argentina with Fernando Rigaray, and we do have some contact with Isidro Moreno in the museum research group at Complutense de Madrid. So that's a little bit like the big frame we are working around. Uh, that's not it. If you go through the profiles of the researchers, you will find more, a lot more. But going into the abstract that I said, I was a little bit more confident about the abstract than the title. Uh, and basically what I've been working on, it's like this shift from 
the theoretical approach with Bill Nichols to a more opera operational perspective, specifically working with Harun Paroki's legacy and how he worked through the idea of operational images and how this little bit like disrupted uh, documentary theory and documentary practice. Uh, specifically, if you want to go specifically through this work, you can go through Juicy Parika's project or the other publications that have been appearing in the recent years that relate to the operational image. And this is a way of connecting documentary tradition with cybernetics studies. So this is a good like node or intersection. Uh, even though Bill Nichols works around the idea of cybernetics, it's it's I would say it's just posing one paper and it's not like there's no a systematic follow up of the of the problems and the concerns of how uh, artificial intelligence or informatics is going to change or impact the documentary tradition. Faroki does it from from a more practical perspective, even though he wrote some things uh, and. The jump from Faroki to Mitel is also to include other audiovisual products like television. Jason Mitel works mainly with television. His book Complex TV uses this idea of operational image, but he speaks about operational aesthetics. So it's the way of, of expanding this possibility of talking how the system of media creation works a little bit. Uh, and the main idea was to relate how image and uh, reality in the times of hyper production of media, it's like falling short or it's posing new questions. And specifically in terms of social impact or other sp spheres like history and politics. So what I tried to do, I, I tried to make like a very brief image to try to tell you how I'm shifting a little bit in terms of my own research, going from a, from a very classic uh, baseline of, of work through Nichols to uh, Faroki and then to the aesthetical approach of Jason Mittel. He doesn't uh, develop a theory on its own, but he works around the idea of how, uh, how the public is now engaged and how they interact with the contents in television, but you can use it for other media. And in terms of crossing a, a not a very common uh, theoretical tradition in Mexico, memory studies are not a big thing here. They just started like 10 years ago. So we're a little bit uh, falling back in that part. And even though most of us have like uh, image studies or visual studies background, or we work with Abby Barberg's tradition and uh, Didi Huberman and uh, John Asman's work going, going into cultural memory, we are now moving a little bit to this Astrid Earls and Ute Seidel's perspective of the transmedia memory, that it's a little bit like pairing up uh, like media ecology to memory studies. So it's like bringing this idea that we can, that every single representation of a uh, historical phenomenon could be seen as part of a transmedia memory. And that it's not just like uh, the, the horizon of expectation, we could say in a more philosophical approach, but it helps to build these tensions and these elements are, that are missing and that help us to bring new questions about the work. So this is a little bit like, the, the theory, but now it's like moving to making analysis and, and a little bit forward to try to produce something. So we're doing the effort to, okay, so this is my standing point. This is the, the perspective. This is like the, the authors or the tradition that I'm working with. But now how do you do uh, a paper or an analysis or, or a research project and then move on to try to make some practical approach to this? Uh, and as you could know, and I, I'm sure that you're experiencing the same thing there, uh, students, they do like theoretical approaches, they do like to read about research, but they absolutely prefer to see it put into practice. So we are doing like this effort of doing projects that are related to producing media or to prototyping things to show them a little bit like the three phases from 
the abstract or theoretical idea to a more practical analytical approach and later on to a technology-based possible project. So this is basically what I'm uh, presenting, or these are the two cases that I'm I'm sharing today with you. Uh, one of them it's Sharon Daniels' work, work. I think she's like one of the best interactive documentary artists in the world. I have the privilege to to be working with her. I would say briefly because we don't have enough time to actually make projects, but we've been lingering around the idea of making a an interactive documentary about the deportation. Uh, process in the United States. It has been really tough, but every year we just jump in and say hello and try to make it happen. And every single time we have a bunch of problems, but we stay in contact and, and we've been uh, working around on ideas and presenting proposals for funding. Uh, and this year we're going to try it again, even though we're in lockdown, but maybe at, we usually get into contact at the end of the year to see what we're doing and to try to put things together for January. So uh, Sharon is a very generous, but uh, uh, she has a, a, a huge uh, uh, agenda. Her, her schedule is almost always packed. So she had uh, this big uh, presentation or the, the, the launching of the exposition in June 2nd this year. Uh, and if you haven't seen this work, I totally recommend it. It's called Exposed, and it's about uh, COVID in California prisons. So she has been doing a, a diary of, of, of follow-up of the news uh, nationwide that talk about how uh, COVID is in impacting the, the jail system, and specifically California. She has been working with... Uh, people in prison since I think it's 2005 or so. So she has been around the, the jail system for a while. And her work is really political in terms of how she approaches and engages uh, uh, interactive documentary. And on the other side, this is like my first prototype, my first interactive documentary that I'm trying to do. It's still uh, a work in progress. We haven't finished yet. It's a very simple approach just to it's a little bit like a like a better uh, proposal and with no money. So we're trying just to put it together to try to look for funding. Uh, and both examples are linked by uh, uh, one characteristic or one element that it's the lack of images or how images are used in the proposal for the creative approach. Uh, I'm going to share with you the PowerPoint later, but here you can you will find I wrote a paper about Sharon's work. It's in Spanish. Uh, this was a, a journal number that was coordinated by Arnau Gifreo, that is one of the references in Spanish of interactive documentary. Uh, we're good friends and we usually are looking for, for new projects to work with. Uh, and this is an approach to two of, of Sharon Daniel's work. So you can look for it, uh, it will be embedded here. But if you don't know her work, I think it's a good idea just to browse a little bit and show you what I'm talking about. So basically, Sharon uh, doesn't work with images or the kind of images that she does are like processed images. What you're seeing in the, in the screen, it's uh, a museum uh, based project that it's called Blood Sugar. Unfortunately, main of her, the, the main part of her work was made in Flash. So right now she's trying to re rewrite the coding to bring them to life again. Uh, and here you can find that tiny video of what it, she does. So this was a little bit like the interface. It's, it's, I know it's tiny, I'm sorry for that, but. The depth of the skin is an unimaginable. This is the only video available. And the idea is that she, instead of using the, like the interview frame of the people talking, she transformed that into a sound wave that works a little bit like the identity or, or the fingerprint of the person she's interviewing. 
and you can jump through uh, links or hyperlinks through the words or the phrases, or you can just go to the next sound wave to hear the next person that it's talking about. The problem of uh, basically uh, injected uh, drugs in the uh, in the jail system and all the health problems that these people suffer through the system while being addicted to a drug. Imaginable paradox. The distance from the surface to its opposite side is minutely fathomless. The skin is both surface and organ, boundary and bridge. It is simultaneously the site of the sense of touch and the seamless enclosure that separates self from other. This is Kim, and uh, we keep it real straight up. And um, I'm uh, 48 years old, and um, it was better for me to be in jail at some point, you know. My experiences um, with drugs. And up here you have some some photographs, like print screens of how it works and how this cloud concept approach to phrases help you to connect the stories of the 14 people that she interviewed. This idea of the metaphor of the cell that also works a lot with the idea of sugar in blood, that it's part of the concept, and that it's a problem for people with addiction, especially if they inject drugs, uh, and how she worked in concentric circles to actually build the content in a more I would say a spatial approach rather than just a, a narrative or, or a, a timeline to work with. You do have a timeline, but you can jump from one interview to the other. Here's the metaphor of the cell and how the sugar affects the cell. And finally, uh, a little bit of more images, how they overlap one on the other and how you can extract information, a little bit of, of all the interface and how it works. Uh, the thing is that, her approach, it's, it's, uh, it's conscious. She, she avoids the using of image of people to make this uh, empathic approach to the use of the, the actual body of the person. So she tries to make an immersion through other ways and especially through sound expansion. And as you could see a lot of uh, graphic and text to make a more abstract approach to documentary. It's not like a, an experience or, or, or a testimonial approach just in the, in the classic sense of having talking heads. She actually tries to go around that part to make you interact and get immersed in the, in the experience. On the other side, I'm working with a, a different, um, I would say nature of what I'm doing. And I had to go the way of making an animation and helping build imagination around the, the character I'm working with and specifically giving some figuration to people. So I tell you a little bit about this project. We work with the biography of the first uh, women deputy in Mexico in the 1920s, Elvia Carrilla Puerto, also known as the Red Nun. And we've been working around the idea of making interactive documentaries of Mexico's 20, 20th century history from a feminine perspective. Uh, and the idea, and, and, and it's a, a horrible panorama, what we have is that even though she is one of the most relevant uh, pioneers in, in Mexican democracy, you can only find like two or three photographs of her on the internet. And you find them because she was also the sister of a governor in the 20s in Yucatan. So that means that there's no images of, of uh, the feminist movement of the 20s in Mexico and later on until the 80s almost. And for example, the, the, the government of Mexico has a, a medal for uh, feminist practices or relevant women in Mexican democracy and politics. And it has her name and you can just find like two photographs of her. So since there is no like a cultural memory uh, dispersed in the population that know who she was and how she looked like and what was the practice in terms of feminist approach. And she was the founder of one of the first uh, journals of feminist theory in Mexico. She was a, a rural teacher in Yucatan with the Mayans. None of this information is known by the people. So we had to do this approach 
to try to work around the idea of making a biography that people could relate to. Uh, let me open it here. Okay, so here it comes. So we had a, a small fund, a small fund like five thousand dollars to develop this, uh, and we're starting building this web page, little animation, and then doing a little bit of uh, it's still on development. Uh, that's why we have like this plate, so it's not the image, the full image working around. And it's a little bit like The Sims. We made this symmetrical map. This is Elvia inviting you to go into the house. You can go through the interactions. We want to refine this parts of the interactivity. And we have uh, like all the spaces, you can just jump into any of those. And the idea of this uh, research project is try to work with uh, secondary schools in Mexico and have this uh, material in open access so they can work around around the idea it's one of the themes that they go through in the secondary level of mexican history but there's no almost none of the bibliography or the materials are related to uh, female movements in the 20th century so we are trying to attach content and perspectives to work around the idea of how women actually ex experienced and helped to build the nation's history uh and the last part of this that it's on the presentation too that you can go through here well the thing is we're we're building here uh, an experience for schools we're making a blog we will put some rubrics and material to work with students in case especially if they don't have connection to internet so how we can make it affordable and, and accessible for everybody uh, we also want to make a translation of, of the content so we can have people from different languages. English would be one, but the other it's uh, uh, the originary uh, population and communities in Mexico. So if we can put it into, into Mayan, into Nahuatl, that would be a great, but as you know, that, that means money. Uh, and we would try to make it like a more interactive approach. So teachers around the country could share their experiences working with the material, uh, presenting it to students and seeing how they are reacting to it. Uh, I can tell you right now it's a prototype and it's uh, like a 25 minute uh, experience that it's really boring. I think it needs a lot of, of refinement in terms of narrative, storytelling and, and animation. We did, we, did, we did a three frame rate uh, per second. So that means that they look a little bit clunky and the movements are not what I would like to have, but that's the money we had to do it. And finally, this is the last part of, of, of what I wanted to show you. Uh, so there are 10 other women that were really important for the 1920s Mexican history. And we've been looking for a year to find some pictures of them. And three of the 10 pioneers of Mexican democracy, there are no photographies at all. So this means that we have a lack of images in terms of historical perspective and in terms of what we can share with our students and kids in terms of what our pioneers looked like. So we need to build it from scratch. They know who Benito Juarez was and Miguel Hidalgo and all the the revolution and independence uh heroes and martyrs but nothing about the women so we need to build that part and that's a great we see it as a great opportunity to intervene right now uh and that's like on the counterpart like using this idea of not using image as a main element here we're working with the idea of lacking images in terms of historical archive so we need to build those images to try to attract the public in, that are like 14 or 15 year old kids. And one of the punchlines of the documentary that I think is really powerful is that Elvia married when she was 14 years old, trying to gain access to education through her husband. And she was one of the first women to get divorced in Mexico. 
to actually get freedom after she was uh, educated. So you can see like the whole process happening at the time of the students' uh, time life. So they can relate or, em or empathize with her being a 15 year old girl that got married to actually have access to, stud to studies. Uh, and this is a little bit of the idea of the world expansion we're trying to do. We're moving to from one biography, we're trying to work around the connection of the other 10 pioneers and trying to build something that it's very complex, that is trying to show the students that they were a, a group, a movement, that it was a system working and that it was related to the to the patriarchal uh, system and all uh, and all the problems that that meant in terms of including women in voting in democracy and in politics and showing the, these connections it's it's a very hard work in terms of research and we're trying to make this approach and now we have like six expansions projected or six dark webs that are related to this and that will be connected and we're trying to make like a uh, world building in interactive documentary that work with biographies or characters, then collectives or groups, and finally with a systemic approach to what the 20th century in Mexico from a female perspective looks like. And final remarks is we've been working like in the three, three lines, theoretical, analytical, and practical in terms of the interactive affordances. This is just uh, cited from, you know, Janet Murray's work and how, what the interactivity allows you to do. But on the other side, we're really interested in, in trying to look for those interactive limits. So what are like the like the blind spots of using interactivity for the new public, especially for students? And right now, as a, a research group, we're trying to look for those expansions and critical nodes of digital humanities that are in our in our panorama in our framework and that actually talk about those uh sustainable goals that we are trying to work around that it's mainly po poverty representation and gender those those are like our three main scopes in terms of trying to build some research and i think i will just leave it here thank you so much this is my email i know you'll have it available but if you're not here it is and I'll stop talking because I love to talk, but I think it's now time to hear. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Diego. Uh, <clears throat> I would clap my hands, but... <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you very much for, for, for your talk. Um, I'd like to invite everyone to, to ask some questions. Uh, if there's anyone that has a already uh, prepared, they can do so. Otherwise, I also have some of my own. Mm. OK, I can pose a question on my own while you uh, think a little bit about it. Um, I was um, very interested in this idea of, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but this relationship between the representational mode and the operational mode is mode or aesthetics, right? Um, and how do you, uh, we have two cases here that uh, that have a little bit of, of each. The first one, I believe it's a little bit more operational. Uh, I don't know if I'm wrong, but uh, how do you balance these things? Uh, and how do you feel like this balances? You, you attain an equilibrium uh, that is actually, um, that's actually uh, good for attaining the goals that you want, or when do you use one and when you, do you use the other? I, I would say that we consciously, for this first prototyping of, of the Red Nun that we did, we were not doing an operational approach. We were doing like a classic storytelling approach. Mm -hmm. And this is a little bit to try to catch like the like the balls of the students and the digital literacies they have but i don't know if we are uh, underestimating our students or if they will get bored or not and the first part of it and that's the first part we actually need money to 
work around it to make some focus group with the with the interaction and see how it works. So not just putting it in the schools and say that we just made it for everybody, but actually try to refine it and make a better, better version of it. And so we we post uh, an interaction that it's like a what we what they call the, the pearl collar or or the train that it's just jumping from one video to the other with a different background. So it's a very simple interaction we build there. And, and we are thinking that if they ask us to have a more operational or a more interactive or immersive approach, we will we'll have to redesign a little bit or leave these at like, like a starting point and then move to a more complex approach for the next one. That's why we have six expansions a program to try to build around different approaches in terms of balancing exactly these operational or representational approaches. This one was like the classic one, the one we had to, I would say, like close enough to build it and especially with the money we have. So this is like classic interactive videos, just punch one, go to the other one, have some uh, machinima or some references to go back to the main menu or the map and from there on try to go into another space we wanted to put some easter eggs of, of extra reading and things like that uh, and that's exactly where the money just ran off so <laughs> we are just just presenting this to try to build a phone around it and if not we will try to make it guerrilla style and just with our own money try to build some other things uh, fortunately, the designer, it's, it's outsourced. He's a friend of mine, so I can pull some of his time and just pay him with pizza and beer. So we can do some things, a limited kind of thing, but we can still work on it without having to just let it go. We updated recently the, the, the server space and the name, so we have like a year and a half more to work around. But exactly that's my question, how we balance that. And I would say that my experience there goes through uh, students are starting to have problems with uh, programs because they are going faster and the new pedagogical approaches are very hands-on and they don't have enough time to analyze and, and make a theoretical approach where they have what they call this uh, a Gruyere syndrome that it's a, they have like some parts build in and some parts of the history or the theory, they just don't have it. So they don't know how exactly to relate to media history. And that gives them a lot of problems in terms of how they position themselves in terms of creators. So I would say that they are moving a little bit more into methods of creating content rather than going through the historical approach that I think was more like our kind of approach when we studied. So I think that, th that the pulse is being given through the students in classroom rather than in the projects. And that's a little bit like my guideline to try to see what would my students would like to see or what would they like to do? And inviting them to actually criticize the projects is a way of, of making this happen faster and better, I would say. The thing is that I don't have students uh, devoted to research groups. So we are just trying to get three or four students to have the prototype going and seeing what their inputs are on that. So I would say my intuition or my guideline would be my students in the classes and how they ask me to give them more like method-based approach rather than content approach or history approach. And from there on, try to move into practical uh, decisions in the web documentary specifically. I don't know if I, I, I answered what you were asking, yeah, yeah. but I think it goes through that or things. Yeah, perfectly. Uh, I was thinking that you, you mentioned this idea of the limits of the inter interactivity that you want to explore. Did, did you find that these limits are somehow related or bound to this operational aesthetics, this operational uh, I images, uh, in, in the sense that the more you go onto that side, the more you require your, uh, um, um, let's call it users, spectators, person that witnesses and um, sees the documentary, you require them a little bit more, uh, less of a trivial effort to traverse these documentaries. Um, 
I would say that my limit there, since I'm not a programmer or an engineer and I'm taunted to, to start making research and studying to how to code or how to program. But the thing is, uh, I still think, and this is more like my, my, I would say like my background or the back of my mind telling me what to do. And I would say it's, I don't want to do interactive documentaries that are uh, uh, artificial intelligence based. It's more like a, a way of connecting with people. It's a way of sharing ideas and emotions. So I don't see going the full way and making uh, operational images and, and trying to make an analysis of the processing and the, and, and the uses of, of EI uh, interactive uh, artificial intelligence in terms of building content. I don't want to go through that. I would say like the lab manager tradition. It's more like using that to pose questions to the human turn in, in the digital arena, I would say. So I'm staying on the side of, and maybe this is romantic or classic or, but but trying to make it what I think it's, it's more relevant that is how to connect people instead of just making cool things and, and things like that. So, uh my approach there would be my limit would be to try to make some something that makes sense and the limits are related to the past that would help to understand our present in a better way and i believe that for example this uh feminine approach or female or women perspective helps a lot to rebalance things that have haven't been balanced before so the limits are not technological or in terms of, of artificial intelligence are more like the, in terms of human interaction and in terms of, of yes, and this is like my, my base question is in terms of what the public or, or the interactor understands as immersion right now. So I'm thinking, thinking of the public between 12 and 18 years old and how those students are going to be our students in the communication program when they are 18. So trying to prefigure some, some ways of interacting with them to understand how they think in, instead of just what happens right now that it's put your cell phone away and I don't want to be interrupted and not using second screens, but actually going and flipping around and saying, okay, so what can we do? What's the problem? What are you lacking to understand this process and try to work with them instead of uh, trying to work against them. I do see that we have to give them some disciplinary approaches and some perspective ha hasn't changed. Like for example, if you have a 70 year old client, you need to convey a way of understanding each other. But if you're trying to build your own voice or create your media, I think that making them as, a, as an image of ourselves, it's, it's the wrong way to go, I would say. So that's like my limit. I am not a, so interested in the technological. It's more like posing the questions and try to see how we can build immersion and interaction related to that. Yeah, I find, I find it uh, very enticing because the idea of having all these limits that you mentioned is not, not necessarily bound to the, to the artifact itself. They, they are bound to whom interacts with this artifact. And this creates a very humanistic relationship with 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 the content with the images themselves so um this these limits are uh all about who, who sees are about the beholder so this is very interesting for me and this this takes us to to uh, one thing that is the multidisciplinarity that you have in your team so uh i don't know if you know anyone wants to, to pose another question, but one of the things that I uh, saw here was that your team is a multidisciplinary team. And this is very important for you that you mentioned. Uh, would, would you like to, to, uh, to, to comment on how this, this team of yours being a multidisciplinary team is the, one of the best ways to go for this kind of research that you're doing? Absolutely. Uh... We've been in a serious campaign to try to uh, bring uh, more female researchers and teachers to the school. It was a very male-based uh, uh, 
group, especially researchers, we don't have so many women. So uh, the, the humanities school in Tech de Monterrey, it's, it's the most diverse one. And we and we are as you as you saw it we were we were five guys and two women so that means that even us are lacking in perspective uh, and Techno Monterey has started to have affirmative actions like four or five years ago we were not uh, we were a conservative school but we are not religious related so it was a little bit weird it was more like a I would say a conservative, uh, non-religious university, and diversity was not a thing until like five or six years. And and actually, it was a student-based approach uh, to open to diversity. And now, the more active student groups are the groups that work around the diversity. So, what I see in my institution is that students are putting the pulse on things, and. Uh, that's why it's not just, I would say, interdisciplinary or multidisciplinary and trying to build this equality perspective, but actually, I would say intergenerational. I think we need the students to work around this. So we don't have them related. It's really hard to build things for them. It's just like I tell them, it's like old guys trying to do things for them to like, and it's not happening. <laughs> it's just not happening. So if we don't have the dialogue between the students and the teachers or the researchers and the producers, I think it's not going to apply. Uh, and in terms of the multidisciplinary, I can tell you this prototype was actually made by uh, a colleague of mine that it's not at Tecna Monterrey. She's a, a secondary level uh, teacher. She's uh, uh, She has a an undergrad in history and she's doing her actually this is her ma uh, project in educational technologies and i was like the link to try to make the production and now we're expanding it to the to the to the team but yeah the idea is that that we jump in from this multidisciplinary approach and try to build something around and we have to well one it's not in our research group it's in another research group but we have two of the most well-known specialists in female movements in Mexico. So I feel covered in terms of research, in terms of perspectives, bibliographies, archives. So we've been working around that part and it's it's a it's a joy to actually have this possibility to di have dialogues with, uh, with them and, and start building around something that we do think that it's lacking in, in our perspective. So totally, I would say that it's, uh, multidisciplinary but also intergenerational what we need to do that's that's wonderful uh something that sometimes is is is, is missing you know uh it's not is this cross culture uh that you have between different uh generations and different disciplines that uh, actually makes us see uh maybe what's missing and having different inputs and something to think about an outside the box that uh, only a single discipline uh, uh, works on. I would like to to know if there's anyone that wants to pose a question uh, or Nelson. I'm sorry. Sorry. I, I, I have a, a phone call. Um, Diego, I, I, I have a, one question since the beginning. Well, this is not a question only specific for your work. It's a question related with this, uh, these interactive documentaries and, and all these, these new new wave of, of web docs. Uh, well, we know that these web docs bring, bring, um, bring this knowledge and, and the knowledge that we build on, we'll bring it to, to, to new waves of people, to new people interested in, in, in knowing these matters, like, like, like this person from, from Mexico, this, this woman that, that you were talking about that is not talked about in the, in the, in the regular media and that you, you want to bring into the front of, 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 the, of the media landscape and talk about. And I was thinking about the questions that arise when when we create these these documentaries, these interactive documentaries, that people, well, this is this is something that we have new we have known for the past 20, 30 years is that people normally they prefer to be on the, on the on the linear or or stand back position, not to interact. But the question here is not related with that. 
is that feeling that we have built some interesting projects, some interesting web docs, and we have demonstrated the power of this mode of communication. Even so, we, sti we are still assisting, well, it's my perspective because I'm not a specialist in documentary, so I'm asking this to you. I have this, this impression that the documentary that still has the most, uh, the most interest or, or, or that builds the most uh, number, the, the bigger number of followers uh, is the, lin the linear ones or, or, the, or the cinematic ones, if you want to say, well, of course, we have Netflix, and Netflix brings the, these some of these documentaries, not all the, the indies and all the alternative ones that we know that exist and that don't come to to Netflix, Amazon, and uh, and HBO and all these these channels. But I, I, I wanted to ask you, what do you think beyond the question of being of standing bad or not one of being lazy and don't want to interact what do you think it's the most problematic thing that we have here because as you were talking in your talk here you had problems with funding to produce the documentary probably if you wanted to produce a documentary more a film like documentary it would it be easier cheaper i don't know do, do you think we have a problem on the both sides Absolutely. Uh, I would say that actually the, the, the most popular documentary, it's, it's a television based. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and that's because it makes it's more like info entertainment rather than actually. So the, this was a little bit of our intuition. It's not, I would say, tested and theoretical solid, mm -hmm. but it's, it's a way of trying to make in, it's like a storytelling, but in blocks and not because, and I have to say this, and this is one of my concerns, uh, not because the narrative demands it, but actually the pedagogical intervention demands it. Mm. So, so, so the time that students actually are focused now, it's, it's a very short window. Mm. And we've done that to them. It's not their fault. It's our fault. <laughs> so... Yeah. It's like five, six minute uh, range with a little bit of, of discussion. So it's more like a pedagogical based uh, yeah. chopping. And, and I know it's not a domesticated technology. It's not, it's not like a, a regular use, but the thing is it, it's, it's meant to be seen during classes as a support for a pedagogical process of understanding the 20th, 20th century of Mexican history. And shifting uh, to a female perspective, uh, trying to imagine how it would be to be a 14-year-old girl in the 20s yeah. trying to study and things like that. So it's more like a, I would say it has the same emotional base that a, that a linear documentary. Mm -hmm. It's using this idea of storytelling and animation to try to make it fly and make it a little bit more digestible for the students but i don't know if we are as i was saying uh underestimating them if it's not like making a, like a little bit cartoonish or or silly for them yeah. and, and so how serious that serious game is and how storytelling based is yeah and that's that's one of our concerns there and uh the problem is that the documentary that it's fixated in our in our mind it's more Obviously, you think about the film festivals or the or the cinematic ones that are really like astounding. But the thing is that the base of consumption it's in television, and it's basically related to true true crime, to violence, or to nature. So those are like the three themes that yeah, yeah, all right, usually work. So so mm -hmm. it's it's not a genre that I would say that it's like their 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 preference of of watching. Mm -hmm. But also the thing is that, uh, and this is one of the problems here, uh, five years ago, the federal government said that they would have free access to internet for all the population, that they would have uh, tablets for all the uh, students in public schools, and that hasn't happened. So the digital turn in the federal uh, schools hasn't happened. Yeah. And it was a little bit like pushing a little bit how we can make content that it's affordable, sustainable. And mm -hmm. that makes sense in terms of what the students need. So it was a way of complementing since the government is just giving you the books, like the textbooks, 
how we can build some content that it's accessible, free, mm -hmm. and ready to use everywhere in the country. And the internet was like our our answer. It's easier if you do it in television because television has a 98% penetration in Mexico. Yeah. And oh, oh, the, the oh. thing is, uh, the thing is that the government has money to do that, but if you see the the, the pedagogical approach they have in television, in television, and the pandemic showed that it's yeah. just awful. It's 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 half of it. It's trash. The other is just having them connected to spend time. So yeah. I would say that we're trying to look for an equilibrium there, like yeah. a balance, to make it work. You know. Yeah, but, but you 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 touch the. Uh, a, a part that, that's also rising a, a flag to me is, is the is the festivals that we have. We we still have festivals dedicated to animation, to documentary, to film, to short films, to a myriad of different types of film, visual uh, television film like the Golden Globes, all that. But for interactive, we have seen something rising, but then it disappears. Mm -hmm. Even South Southwern Festival has tried. Um, I don't know. A bunch of them have, have had some kind of domains where we have the interactive films. But then it sort of disappear. What do you think it's happening here? <laughs> <laughs> That, that it's not making enough money it's, it's clear <laughs> uh, I can tell you, yes, probably yes. Uh, it was like 10 or 11 years ago that uh, can had what they call the cross media corner and it, yeah. it ran for two years and that was it and then you have people like idox that are doing a great job but it's yeah. z zero money it's more like a, a group of friends rather than so it's it's hard to know. You you see the the COVID thing killed Tribeca's Institute. Mm -hmm. uh, Sundance has a part. And uh, National Film Board of Canada they are moving away from interactive documentary. So yeah. it it's it's now it's looking a little bit more like a fad that just yeah, drifted that's... away rather than an actual right. technology that helped. So yeah. I think what what will happen it's a little bit like we'll stop calling it interactive documentary and just call it internet content i, I don't mind you know it i, yeah. I i'm i'm not uh, uh, making a, a, an evangelion about uh, no, me doing web doc. so <laughs> so if, if you need to call it pedagogical digital content or or whatever I, I, i'm i'm not worried about the thing is that now we have a brand that it's idocs or web docs or whatever you want to call it and and it's and it's struggling to survive. I would say. Yeah, but I, I was remember. Well, this this was when Oscar. It was I can't remember now the name of the director. Um, he has made the Amores the Amores Perros. Uh huh. Uh, Gonzalez Iñárritu. Gonzalez Iñárritu, exactly. He won the Oscar for the VR installation, the first VR Oscar ever, and all that. This was in 2017 already. <laughs> we haven't <laughs> seen anything like it since then. So it's a fad. We know it was a fad. Well, I knew when the VR came for this third or fourth wave, it was a fad. But I, in some sort, I feel a bit a bit sad because I, I haven't had the, the, the chance to experience for real the, the installation, but I've seen some videos that people have made of the installation and it was amazing. It was impressive. The, the, tra the, the, the tra travesty of, of the, the frontier between Mexico and the United States, and it was really, really crazy. But it's like, well, we have also, the, when we look at this project from, from Iñarito, we also have the problem, it's not only Televisual is not only a screen. You need to have all these things around. You have to build a, a very specific composition of a set of a scene, like a theater plus film plus computers. I don't know. Is this too much? Uh, My brother is a philosopher, and he has he once said a phrase that it just shook me to the bone. That it was if they keep. Uh, investing and, and enhancing the the, the Kinect thing, mm -hmm. they will reinvent the theater. Yeah. 
So I what's the point? I was a bit of that. <laughs> <laughs> so if we already have the theater, why we need to reinvent it? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 and he's an historian too, so it had a, a little bit of a punch there of, of in perspective, it's just like a fad. But what, what I'm thinking, and this would be like my two cents on the, on the business is that we think that we're doing internet and platforms Netflix is the, the main mm. uh, partner or thing right now in terms of content uh, distribution. And they name themselves as a global television channel. Yeah. So who actually is winning its television formats? Yeah. So everything that works around, I would say, for the next decade are television-oriented, distributed, and merchandised. If you're trying to make something disruptive, I would say we're in a very conservative era of our times. And if, if you fold in into something that television can make profit of, yeah, like what Janet Murray is doing with the second screen research, I think you will survive. If you're trying to just <laughs> break the mold and make González Iñárri to, to win an Oscar again, it's not going to fly. It's not going to happen. <laughs> so... Fray uh, Servando, uh, uh, a Mexican, uh, uh, Fray Servando he was a, a Mexican religious. He said that the, the situation is tragic. My spirit is optimistic. <laughs> so I, I, tried, I tried to keep it up, but I think it's a very dark time to be around. True crime, it's almost 70% of, of all TV production in the United States. They are just obsessed and that filtrates yeah. a lot. Netflix in Mexico is starting to build things about the, the, the narcos and the drug sales, and this is dominating the, the, the content. So we're not fighting against that. It's, yeah. that was, that's why we're working in an ecology-based approach. So this yeah. is a complementary thing to try to, if you can just bring three students to understand how it was to be a girl in the 1920s, I'm just paid off so it's not like gaining dominance in the media uh, horizon it's more like struggling and fighting back a little bit what is happening with netflix and the rest of the people right now okay thank you diego pedro i yeah. think that we have passed the yeah. time no we are exactly on the limit uh so um let's wrap this up thank you diego I we have no, Marina, Marina oh, has Marina. a question. Yes, yes, Marina, yes, Marina. Us for the last minute. All right, yes. last minute question. Sorry, if I Marina. may, if I may. Yeah, uh, of course. Of course. <laughs> Thank you, Nelson, for the warning about this conference, uh, this seminar. And thank you, Diego, for a uh, uh, very interesting uh, um, exposition of. Uh, an interesting experience. So I have one uh, question. Uh, have you thought about uh, uh, inviting high school students to make animation and sound? Um, so therefore broadening the levels of interactivity and uh, creating a specific uh, teaching methodology. And uh, also at the same time, uh, to, uh, to, to getting around the funding problems. So <laughs> I wonder. Uh, we've been working other kind of contents related to that, uh, more like traditional short documentary films uh, based in going to communities. And actually we've been working not only with, with uh, secondary level students, but actually primary level students, kids between six and 12 years. Uh, but it's more like a community-based approach. The school, it's not like the center. We've been doing it with, if the communities go through the church or if they have a cultural center or, or whatever. And, and this like collaborative approach to documentary media production, it's a, a real thing for almost 40 years in Latin America. So we've been using that method to try to intervene in communities. And this is the other part of what we use to try to build our method to try to start building together. This one, it's, it was more like prototyping for funding, I would say. 
And the the animator, uh, it's one of my former students in the in the animation program. So he's like a 23 year old guy that he's amazing. And his girlfriend, she was like 20 years old uh, at the time. She's a psychologist and she was learning to, to make animation. So we, she, he said, I want to, she wants to learn and I'm going to teach her. So we're going to use your project as a way of learning. And I said, no problem. We're just looking for funding. So it also was a way of, of prototyping things and methods and ways of building things. And I think we're not ready to start prototyping things that we can have collaborative approach to animation and sound. And we've been doing documentaries in a week with this uh, base model. So we're, we're not afraid of going that way. And it, it works a little bit with the, with the last circle that we had, the number three, that was a, a kid's approach to playing. So we, we have some experience with ludology and with building uh, tools to work with students in, I would say in K-12 and K-15 for, for these kind of things. And doing creative projects is some of the things that schools are lacking. So it's a way of winning, winning, I would say. And I, I think this experience, it's not only Latin American, uh, there's a lot of references in Canada and in the United States and in, in Europe and in Africa, there's a bunch of, of collaborative things going around. And, and I do think that as Marie de Rose says, it's not do it yourself, but do it with others. So it's a more horizontal approach. The, the conflict there is I get paid for it. So the way it's how to find funds to actually match the expectations and the needs that the communities have. So that's my concern. It's not just make us look better. And it's not about it. It's about having impact and actually engage with communities and have stable relationships with them and building citizenship and democracy with them. So it's it's hard to put the things together to actually have something that is relevant. So it's it's tough, but we've done it and we think we can make it fly. The thing is that animation, it's a whole different piece from documentary. So going that way means a lot of time, a lot of money, at least in our ideal or utopic approach. But we will go just guerrilla style and just make drawings with people and start animating and doing things like that. And we, we made a paper about the methodology for documentary films that we work. We work with a person from Peru that it's called Jose Balado. He has a... a uh, page that it's called Docu Peru. I strongly recommend it. He has like 350 documentaries that he has done through 17 years of practice. He makes a, a tour through Peru making documentaries on, on summer. He's one of our teachers and instructors. I had just had a, a course with him and we made a paper. It's in Spanish. I'm sorry, but I think you can grasp most of it. Uh, about how he works the methods and how he talks instead of, of technology, he, worked, he says that it's his toys and how the kids bring the toys from the community to work together and make something. So we're trying to build also some knowledge about the methods and, and I will try to write something about, that's one of the, my, my goals as a personal researcher, doing writing about the methods of how to interact with new generations. So that's a, a huge, huge area that it's not, I would say, sufficiently work around. So there's an opportunity there to work around. So thank you so much. I left my, my email on the chat. Uh, I'm absolutely open to hear from you. I would love to, uh, if you have any question or doubt, or you think there's a project we can work together, I totally open. Thank you so much. Thank you, Diego. Thank you very much for your availability and your talk. <laughs> Thank you, Diego. This, it was really, really good, really, really interesting. And then and this final point so on the collaboration and, and all the perspectives that we have on when, when we go with talking with these communities, of course, we want to build communities ties uh, and all that but in the end we are being we are being paid and then the others around are not and also this creates some imbalance but this should not also stop us to try and go for it and then work around this and find fundings to 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 maintain these ties and fortify them 
Okay, thank you again, Diego, Tienko. Thanks, Pedro. Thanks to all of you that have stand here till the end.